I'm the last one. And I always used to get to go first, because I'm Alvarez, so this is good for my character. Dr. Billington, Mrs. Billington, fellow writers, friends, members of Congress, distinguished guests, I think that's everybody. <laughs> President um, Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama in absentia. It's a great honor to be with you here tonight, if a bit daunting. I have to tell you that I have been waiting for this moment for a long time. And by this moment, I actually don't mean my being up here tonight. I mean the Obamas being over there in the White House. Oh, all five of them, yes, including Abuelita, Grandma. We Latinos believe in extended families. In fact, I could have brought a handful of sisters, a dozen cousins, a ton of tias and tios, a swarm of sobrinitos and sobrinitas, nieces and nephews. Instead, it's just me here tonight with, out there in the audience, my beloved compañero Bill, who keeps me honest. When I told Bill that I'd been chosen to speak to you tonight, he got a baffled expression on his face, and he asked, why you? <laughs> so I told him that the committee had decided that they needed a wise Latina up here to round up the group. <laughs> but I better not play that card and get myself or the president or our new Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor in trouble. But it is a good question. Yeah, why me? And I have an answer if I may quote one of our wonderful contemporary writers and orators. If there is anyone out there who doubts that America is a place where all things are possible, who still wonders if the dreams of our fathers and mothers is alive in our time, who still questions the power of our democracy, tonight is your answer. Well, my husband isn't the only one surprised. Remember all those relatives I told you about? Some of them are still scratching their heads about how Julia, be about Julia becoming much of anything, no less an American writer. You see, back in the Dominican Republic, where I was growing up in the 1950s, I was the kid who didn't do well in school. Why would I? When school meant memorization, indoctrination, what passes for education in a dictatorship. I was not a reader. Why would I be? The only books around were dull textbooks. So I was the kid in the family that flunked every grade through fifth grade and had to go to summer school every year. You can understand then why all those relations are still scratching their heads. <laughs> but the one who is most surprised is the 10-year-old immigrant girl I still carry inside me. August 1960, my family arrived in New York City fleeing the dictatorship of Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. It was a rough start. Overnight, we had lost everything, our country, our home, our extended family structure, our economic security, our language. We arrived in this country at a time in its history that was not very welcoming to people who were different, whose skins were a different color, whose language didn't sound like English. This was the United States of the early 60s, still locked in the civil rights struggles, pre-women's movement, pre the Equal Rights Amendment, pre-multicultural studies, pre-anything but the melting pot, that old assimilationist mainstreaming model. But there were promising signs, even in the midst, in the midst of those first difficult years. The first was the incredible boon of a public library. And I remind us all, I don't have to, the other writers have done so, that we're here um, this weekend because of the big mother of our public libraries, the Library of Congress. <laughs> A public library. I couldn't believe this amazing place filled with interesting books you could borrow. We had come from a dictatorship where the population was not to be trusted with books. Here was a country in which you were given free access not just to textbooks 
or doctrinaire biographies and histories, but to fun books about a teenage girl detective without a mommy to stand in the way of her solving mysteries <laughs> and driving a convertible and having a boyfriend, about a boy who didn't like school either, escaping on a raft with a runaway slave down the Mississippi River. You could be a prince, you could be a pauper, you could be a slave girl, you could be a girl in the Sultan's court saving your life by telling a story. I was drawn in. I became a reader. I sat down at the big circle of storytellers, an inclusive place, a protected space. I experienced the world according to others. I dwelt in possibility, as Emily Dickinson claimed poems let us do. I learned how to navigate my way in the real world of the United States of America because stories gave me a craft in which to sail and a grand narrative of adventure. People born into this birthright of public libraries often don't realize what an amazing privilege and resource this is. I know I never would have become a writer if I hadn't had access to the American treasure house of public libraries. Another promising sign, November 1960, a Catholic had been elected president. <laughs> Imagine that. And what really won my heart now that I was becoming a reader was that this was a president who knew how to put words together. So they released the winged life, made hope and history rhyme. A president who invited a poet to his inauguration, Mr. Robert Frost. Isn't it all beginning to sound like deja vu? I began to believe, oh yes, I did, that despite the bullies in the playground and the prejudice in the culture, despite its own painful civil rights struggle, this country couldn't be all bad. So what I never would have imagined growing up female in the 1950s in a dictatorship in the Dominican Republic, I became an avid reader. And soon, like all smitten readers, I dreamed of writing books myself. I especially loved poetry, maybe because the cadence musical language of a poem reminded me of my native language, a way to speak Spanish and English. In one of those poetry anthologies I took out of the library, there was a little poem that meant a great deal to me. I too sing America by Langston Hughes. You see, even though I dreamed of becoming an American writer, back then we weren't reading any books written by people like me. The big boom of multicultural literature, the opening of the canon to non-traditional writers, even to all but a few women writers, was in the future. And so the message to me was that although the underlying truth of everything I was reading was, to quote Terence, the Roman slave and playwright who freed himself with his writing, he said, I am a human being, nothing human is alien to me, still, there were big gaps in that shelf of literature. But then among absent voices and missing stories, I found the Langston Hughes poem, I too sing America. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. That was music to my ears. This was an important voice for a young girl of another culture and language and background with her heart full of dreams to hear. A promise made to me in a poem by a black poet I didn't know, in a book I took out of the library, kept alive in my heart the possibility that I too might someday sing America. That is what we are celebrating here this weekend. We have gathered to celebrate the liberating power of story and the intrinsic democracy of reading. To oh say what we see, we meaning all of us, to bear witness to the fact that words do matter, that they keep alive in us, even in the worst of times, the promise, the hope, 
the belief in a saving grace and the better angels of our nature.